Phoenix, thank you for talking to us. Can you tell us a little bit about the Equality Rights Group? Indeed, we started off um, not being called Equality Rights Group. Back in September 2000, it was called Jib Gay Rights. At that time, the main issue that we needed to make some real sort of um, movement on in Gibraltar was the LGBT issue. There was absolutely nothing that had happened in Gibraltar to advance the agenda for LGBT people in Gibraltar. The only thing that had happened seven years prior to that in 1993 was that under pressure from the Council of Europe, which is the body, as you know, that uh, overlooks the European Convention of Human Rights and to which the UK is a signatory, um, pressured Council of Europe to the UK saying, hey, UK, you need to change things in Gibraltar because Gibraltar is still not decriminalizing homosexual acts. So the UK puts pressure, political pressure on Gibraltar and the then government um, had to introduce amendments to what was our criminal ordinance as it was known at that point. And as a result it was homosexual acts were no longer criminal. Up to that point, at least in theory, um, buggery as it was called sexual relations between two men was punishable with life imprisonment as a maximum here in Gibraltar here in Gibraltar of course as in the UK prior to 1967 when the UK partially decriminalized England and Wales exactly England and Wales uh, when they partially decriminalized it then under the 1967 sexual offenses act um, the fact that that it was on the statute it didn't necessarily mean that at that stage the authority was necessarily pursuing everybody on that basis of uh, putting prison, putting people in prison for, for their whole lives. So Were many people prosecuted here? No. Um, in the last in the last stages, in the last 20 years prior to 1993, there was very little in terms of taking it right to the extreme of putting people in prison and so on. There were uh, people who were uh, done for things like cottaging and so on, um, but they were, they were minor. But nonetheless, in a tiny community, even minor offences that came up publicly in the press and so on, basically destroyed reputations for the rest of their lives, employment and so on. So it was, it was fairly serious even then. But 1993 brought an end to that. And I arrived in the year 2000. I'm Gibraltarian, born in Gibraltar, but I've grown up in, in the UK. And in 1997, I come back to live in Gibraltar and I discover that things had stayed fairly unchanged from 1993 onwards. Um, and I didn't think that that was a just situation. So I found a lot of suffering still going on in Gibraltar. So I basically decided to launch uh, a group which was then called uh, Chip Gay Rights. I tried to ask people to join me in the early stages, other people who were active in the community and, and well known, but no one wanted to, um, to join me. Would you say it's single handedly you achieved equality? In the early stages, I single handedly set it up, uh, and after that, I started getting people who joined me. Um, but at the early stages nobody wanted to come anywhere near this and I realized that I had two options. One was to look at this in the face and take whatever the consequences were or to run away from it. And I decided that running away just was not an option for me anyway. So I just went away and basically lied to everybody and set out a press release saying that I had an executive, saying that I had a group and at that point it was an untruth. Within two weeks it wasn't an untruth because within two weeks uh, I'd called a public meeting and I had a very reasonably sized uh, first meeting with people at which we agreed a constitution and the whole thing started from there. People started coming to meetings and so on and that's where the story starts. So um, the people coming to the meetings, were they LGBTQI and straight? Like no, at that, at that stage it was lesbian um, and gay men. And were people afraid at those meetings? Were they anonymous? Yes, yes, yes. There was, a, there was a great sense of, oh, I'm coming to the meeting, but I don't want anybody to find out. I don't want my name to go out. So I ended up being the face and the name that went out on the press releases and the, the media interviews and so on. Um, and that lasted for a very long period of time. Um, Although, as I say, it started getting people on board to work with me as part of the group, 
um, for a very long time, those who came onto the executive would be people who were happy to work with me, but not to be openly known. That has changed dramatically. What has changed the attitudes? What's changed? The attitude is that as a result of the group being out there, as a result of constantly pressing for change and starting a social dialogue, the, the ice was broken, people started to speak more openly, we started to achieve real changes with um, the first major change that, that we achieved was a challenge to government policy on housing at the time which discriminated against LGBT couples. Um, they did not qualify for government housing. We challenged that when uh, a lesbian couple decided that they wanted to challenge government on this. We took that to court with the help of um, friendly pro bono human rights lawyers in Gibraltar. Uh, we lost at two levels here in Gibraltar, but it, the, le the next stage um, in uh, the Privy Council in London, we won it. And so the Gibraltar government had to change their policy to a non-discriminatory uh, housing policy. And what year was that? That was the year 2009, end of 2009. After that, mm. after that come challenges from us on the age of consent, which was unequal at that time. It was um, 18 mm -hmm. for, for LGBT people and 16 for heterosexuals. We challenged that after a long campaign. We eventually ended up in the Supreme Court in Gibraltar and we won it. Was that 2012? That was 2011-12, yes. And also you achieved in 2014 civil partnerships. Civil partnership came, came next. Um, and heterosexual and that's right we insisted on that um, which isn't the same in England and Wales that's correct that's correct uh, we're ahead of England and Wales in that particular count we've always been up till now really behind the UK and kind of copy pasting what was happening in the UK to Gibraltar but on that particular count we insisted in our negotiations with government um, that if civil partnership came in it had to be applied equally to all because that is the basis to any kind of democracy. A democracy has to apply law equally to everybody and we were not for any kind of apartheid or segregation. We did not want anything that was specifically going to be um, endorsing uh, LGBT relations on its own. We felt it was necessary to include anybody who wanted to participate in civil partnerships. So we insisted on that. We had some resistance to that, but in the end, government was persuaded. And so we have um, civil partnerships since then applicable to anybody, regardless of gender or sexual orientation. And then two years later, 2016, you achieved marriage equality. That's right. Um, government in Gibraltar at that stage felt like they've done their duty by introducing civil partnership, but we insisted that that wasn't the end of the of the road, that um, they had to finish the job. Um, and uh, they didn't make, despite a, a very open and very large campaign that we ran in the media and publicly in Gibraltar for um, civil marriage for everybody, um, despite that the government did not include in their manifesto for the last elections in 2015, did not have a, a clear commitment to equal marriage in the same way that they'd had for civil partnership. So they, then there were various um, moves where they tried to um, uh, persuade people that what we needed to have was a referendum on the issue. Again, we completely resisted that. We felt that on fundamental rights issues, um, there was no question uh, to be had and that needed to be referended. So uh, again, we won on that particular issue. Government eventually was persuaded by our campaigning and by the fact that there was quite a lot of clamour from the public at large. We had a lot of activism happening around the LGBT community and the straight community because we'd worked very hard over the years to make sure we created solid alliances with um, the straight community as well. So you've had a lot of straight allies? A lot of straight allies. That's been very, very important to us. What has your group's the Equality Right Group's relationship been like with the Gibraltarian government over the years? Well, we've had, we've experienced two in the time that we've been campaigning. In the early stages, the government that was in was called the, um, the Gibraltar Social Democrats, the GSD. And with that, it was almost a toxic relationship because the then chief minister, who was in power for 16 years in Gibraltar, 
um, wouldn't even meet with me or with the group. Really? And uh, in, in, in the few responses that we had to any correspondence that we had with him, urging him for dialogue, um, basically the, the one letter that he ever wrote back to us was basically to say, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, over my dead body unless I'm really pushed and, and forced to by by legislation. Um, what was his basis for that? Was it? Well, he was he 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 was and is uh, a fairly orthodox, uh, a committed, practicing Catholic, and his was really a religious objection to it. And although his own party was fairly split mm. on the issue, there being some kind of liberal types within that conservative party, um, there were others who were in the majority who uh, defended the complete blocking of any uh, progress. On. What about his successor? His successor is not of the same party. His successor is of the Gibraltar Socialist Labour Party in alliance with the Liberal Party. And we had already broken through in working with them as early as I think around 20, 2004, 2005, when we um, embarrassed them enough to eventually take a position publicly uh, supporting advances on LGBT issues, one of them, one of the, the goals being arriving at uh, civil partnership and the inequal age of consent. So when they got into power in 2011, they had already included in their manifesto civil partnership. So that was, it was a good relationship um, and it was a good relationship. We were carrying forth basically something that they as a party felt at that time was convenient and was just, and they included it in their political agenda. Uh, the problems begin to happen with them when we start asking and pushing for equal marriage, um, which in Gibraltar was headlined as um, one civil marriage law for all. Uh, again, we did not want any apartheid legislation specifically for gay marriage. We actually opposed that. We said, no, it has to be the main uh, civil marriage legislation in Gibraltar, which merely needs some tweaking to include people of the same gender. That's all it needs. We don't need separate gay marriage legislation. That's completely against what we stand for. It was about equality. About equality. And um, so as, as a result of that, uh, that's when some friction started to happen. Uh, the Chief Minister was, was uh, hesitant about pushing his margins. He'd already, I guess, risked quite a lot politically by going for civil partnership. It was only two years afterwards and we were already pressing for equal marriage. But we persisted in that. We ran major campaigns in the press, um, taking uh, whole page adverts and so on. And uh, that was very successful. So he, ha he had to give in on that one. But that's when the problem begins to arise because we'd always, always been a human and civil rights organization in which we had within our scope and within our telescope um, our view of a wide human and civil rights um, movement in Gibraltar which we'd never had in Gibraltar until that date. So we always knew that we'd get to the point where our initial main campaign for which we began to get established and known the LGBT issue would come to an end but then we would have the space to be able to develop human rights issues on other areas and so of course now we have we're now beginning to trespass into territory that perhaps are not so comfortable for, for political parties which is where we're questioning about our areas of, of our democracy in Gibraltar the role of our media which is under total subsidy uh, well, majority subsidy directly from government um, which therefore is a huge problem as we see it for any democracy when, when, when the media are so close to government influence because they're dependent financially on them, uh, where we don't have, for example, um, any uh, transparency with regards to where donations and contributions to politicians and political parties are coming from. We have no gauge on who is actually uh, backing different groups in, in Gibraltar political movements and so on. There are a lot of issues that, that we're asking questions on, which are very uncomfortable now. I think it's the first time in Gibraltar that anybody's asking those kind of uncomfortable questions. Um, it's a small community. People are easily feel like they don't really want to show their face on any particular issues. And when you begin to touch issues which come very, very close 
to the political parties and the politicians and we begin to emphasize the importance of civil society rather than the dependence on politicians and political parties per se, uh, it becomes slightly dangerous for people here. So it takes a lot to really stand up uh, in Gibraltar and uh, to be able to challenge. Um, one, of the, one of the consequences of that, of course, is that, um, as we're beginning to experience now, is that you begin to feel like you're being eliminated from the media in Gibraltar. And we're certainly beginning to feel that. Is uh, the media mainly supportive? Yes, that's the reality. You know, we have a maximum population here of 32,000 people. You're not going to get 32,000 people buying the main newspaper in Gibraltar. Um, nor are there going to be enough advertisers for the Gibraltar Broadcasting Corporation television programs to be able to exist simply on their income from advertising. So therefore, it's really important that the media, which plays such a crucial role in scrutinizing and keeping the political elite uh, in, under control, mm -hmm. at least quite a lot of control elsewhere, it's very important that, that they be as independent and as protected from political control and influence as possible. We are challenging the situation in Gibraltar with respect to that, because we see there's far too close mm. a knit between the main newspapers and uh, outlets in Gibraltar and, and the political establishment. We want to change that. Are Gibraltarians generally supportive of LGBTQI issues? That's changed a lot over the last 17 years since we started. I don't think ever that there was a huge sense of homophobia in Gibraltar. Gibraltar does tend to be, although it's our mantra, and to some extent it's, it's true and not true, um, that we're a very tolerant society. Yes, we are on the surface and so on, but with respect to um, homophobia, uh, Gibraltar has always been fairly tolerant so long as you fitted into the stereotype. Mm. If you were the funny one, if you were the one who dressed up in a particular way or walked in a particular way, then that was acceptable. The problem started to arise with homophobia in Gibraltar when we started challenging that. We are saying, no, hold on, yes, there are some men and there are some women who are like this and who are like that, and that's perfectly fine for them. There's no reason why they need to be discriminated in any way. But the, 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 the width of uh, types or typologies mm -hmm. for LGBT people is, is as wide as it would be for any other part of the population. So it's at that point when we begin to challenge people's stereotypes and people boxing us in particular areas where it's neat and where they can control you in a particular way that they start to feel a little bit, um, a little bit threatened. And at that point, we begin to see uh, some elements of homophobic violence and, and so on in Gibraltar. Gibraltar's come a long way since 1993, but there's still a little bit of a way to go. I think there's no anti-discrimination laws in the provisions of goods and services. And if I'm right in thinking, there's still no right to change your legal gender. Are these issues that are being worked on? Yes, in actual fact, there has been some, some developments on both of those things more recently. With regards to gender equality, we do have now uh, uh, some safeguards with regards to transgender uh, people. We've recently, it, it's been an issue which I've long really wanted to work and campaign on in Gibraltar. The problem we had with that was that we couldn't really do so unless we had the involvement of transgender people themselves, because otherwise I think it would have been a bit condescending of us to be raising the flag on, on um, transgender issues when we ourselves were not transgender. The majority of people who were working with us were either lesbian, gay men, or straight people. So it, to represent people in their absence, I didn't think was on. Um, but um, in the last couple of years, we had one individual in Gibraltar who came out openly as transgender. It was somebody who's very popular in Gibraltar, very well liked. Um, uh, a lady who's in her 60s now and um, came to us with the transgender issue that uh, she wanted her paperwork, her identity card and so on to uh, reflect the fact that she was a woman, not a man. Um, and we worked that issue and in fact uh, managed to, to get that changed. So that and the introduction of the Equal Opportunities Act, um, that combination means that we do now have transgender uh, 
uh, rights in Gibraltar, which we didn't before. What was the other issue that you asked? Uh, so there were two issues. There was the uh, one about changing legal agenda, yes. and then the other was no anti-discrimination laws in the provisions of goods and services. Right. With goods, with goods and services, um, we had one of our earliest successes was in transposing an EU directive and I think that probably would have been around 2003-2004 it was originally known as the EU Framework Employment Directive mm -hmm. and the Framework Employment Directive was transposed into Gibraltar law as the Equal Opportunities Act and the Equal Opportunities Act does have um, uh, quite a lot of um, provisions with regards to, to the points that you've just raised on, on transgender and uh, goods and services. Uh, goods and services uh, does have a, a, a couple of sections in, in that particular act which covers that but there is some question about it because there are two distinct sections in that act where one seems to conflict with the other but the present government is certainly um, it does seem to be uh, interpreting it in a positive direction so we don't have a major problem on that we are waiting to clarify that if we need to campaign wise mm. and pressure wise uh, for when somebody does actually come and say look I've been to a hotel and they refused to serve me or to give me a room because I'm gay in that case we would have a case which we would actually take before a judge what are the further challenges that LGBTQI Gibraltarians face in terms of the law or social attitudes? I think the, 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 the major challenge we face here now is not so much legislative, because I think we've reached practically every goal. Um, I think we're pretty much on a par with most other European countries, which is not bad. I mean, in 16 years or so of, uh, you know, to achieve what we've achieved, it's not bad when you compare 80 or 70 or 50 years elsewhere. But then we, we managed to jump on a, on a train that was already moving at the time when we started. So part of, part of it was already achieved elsewhere. The main, the, main, um, the main challenge for us now, I think, goes to taking us beyond the LGBTIQ issue, where we begin to see it as part of a wider um, uh, framework uh, which touches on our community in the wider sense. I'm talking here about Gibraltar as a community, which is in terms of democracy, which is in terms of citizenship, which is in terms of openness and, and living easily rather than with discrimination, rather than with limitations. And that takes, I think, the, the LGBT community towards another area which I've been keen to, to foster um, although I don't think it's been done very explicitly and that is that one thing that I did want to avoid with the LGBT community in Gibraltar is and I say this from my own experience as having worked in the early LGBT uh, movement in the UK in the 70s and having seen it happen elsewhere I did not want to see what was originally a movement working beyond equality which is where it's got stuck get stuck at that stage and I did, certainly did not want to see what I've seen happening in most other countries which is where the LGBT community became pretty much segregated of its own will you go to London and there are particular areas which are gay you go to Madrid again you have another area there which is gay my view is that that is the wrong way to go I think it's the wrong way to go because I think what what it fosters is that you become identifiable different groups segregated in an apartheid of our own choosing and what it leads to is precisely the encouragement of homophobic violence because you again become a community set apart and easily targeted so that I thought from the very beginning was somewhere we did not want to go and I saw it as a lesson learnt from experience elsewhere uh, Gibraltar is too small a place to be able to, to cordon off a particular part of, of the community and I had to resist really some of the commercial 
LGBT entrepreneurs and so on who really wanted to take things in that direction and I never gave them particular encouragement to do so and I'm glad to say that to this date um, it hasn't happened in Gibraltar. So the movement really has to go beyond LGBT now. LGBT now has to be a part of our humanity, has to be part of who we are as people, has to be part of our citizenship in this community and that means taking the margins forward, challenging the politicians to go beyond what our present structures are. There were 30,000 Gibraltarians approximately. What is life like here for people who identify as LGBTQ? Are there bars? Are there restaurants? Are there clubs? Where do people go out? What do people do? How do they meet? There are, um, I think things have changed a great deal as a result of social media. Gibraltar is very big on Facebook. Um, there are quite a number of Gibraltar pages and people do uh, open up and debate and so on. One thing that never used to happen is that uh, people were not visible at the time. LGBT people uh, were very invisible at the time. That's changed over the years since we started campaigning and started talking openly about this and it became a, a, an issue which was more accepted and more open in Gibraltar. Now people you will see when you go onto Gibraltar uh, Facebook pages, you will see them um, posting their, their photograph with their boyfriend or saying they just got married etc etc so that's changed a lot initially there was some years back when we were moving towards civil partnership uh, and the entry of a new um, government in 2011 um, there was some move as I just mentioned by some entrepreneurs to try and create particular venues um, there's one particular area here in Gibraltar called Ocean Village and there was an attempt to start a specifically gay ambience um, discotheque a uh, couple of days a week and growing further than that. Um, that has kind of fizzled out, in part because I haven't encouraged it <laughs> and we haven't wanted to encourage it. We would rather see things going where LGBT people feel totally comfortable being and mixing with heterosexual people in bars and so on. And is it a safe place for visitors who are LGBT? It is, it is, it is a very, Gibraltar is a small place, mm. if you if you carry out any crime of any sort it's difficult to run away without being noticed mm. because uh, there's controls at the border and so on. Mm. It is a fairly safe place, uh, we have had some homophobic violence in the past, I think that seems to be dying away. We haven't had any reports of homophobic incidents in Gibraltar. Of course, there are still people who are homophobic. You're going to get that in practically every society, just as you do people who are still racist in countries which have long had movements and legislation against racism and so on. That's still going to happen. Um, are the Royal Gibraltar Police, are they pretty supportive? Because there are, there are hate crimes here, aren't there? We had our problems with the uh, Royal Gibraltar Police, the RGP, back in the day. Um, we, in the early 2000s, we we held um, like three monthly um, meetings with them to discuss LGBT issues at the time. This is long before any of the advances been made legislatively in Gibraltar, and we had some fairly friendly uh, talks with them. Uh, eventually, though, we walked out and we put an end to those dialogues with the RGP because the then Commissioner of Police when we had just uh, gone through a particularly nasty um, incident of homophobic violence in Gibraltar when we raised that issue at the meeting uh, he told us he was aware of what had happened and we asked him directly you know what do you intend to do with regards to homophobic violence and his response and this is paraphrasing because it was some years back. Mm. Uh, his response is more or less saying there is no homophobic violence. He was in we're, denial. Hold, hold, hold on, wait, we, we've just spoken about this. <laughs> we've just admitted it happened. How come it's not, there's no homophobic violence? It's, it's there. Um, oh, no, no, I'm not going to say that there's any homophobic violence in the world. I said, look, Commissioner, with all due respect, if your basic duty as Commissioner of Police is to look after the safety uh, of each and every citizen in Gibraltar. If you're telling me that you're only willing to consider crimes and offences against the heterosexual community, then I think you are in gross neglect. Uh, and so I really see very little reason for continuing this dialogue with you. Oh no, no, I'm not going to say in that case, you're not going to walk out of our 
of our meeting, are you? So yes, I'm going to walk out of your meeting. And you walked out. And we walked out, and, and since then, we haven't had any official meetings with the RGP, but things have moved on. That particular commissioner has left. There have been changes in our society. There have been changes in the way that our society responds to these things. We have a completely different commissioner. And in fact, I have to say that um, when five or six years ago we started celebrating or commemorating for the first time International Day Against Homophobia in Gibraltar, um, the commissioner of police was one of the people that was uh, available to us and who came to uh, to the actual open meetings and, and filmed by media and so on. So things have improved? Things improved with the RGP. We, we don't really have any problems with the uh, local police any longer. And in fact the Royal Gibraltar Regiment as well, the military in Gibraltar, they're very uh, very supportive as well. We've just had um, uh, a couple uh, one of whom is in the uh, RGP getting married and being very open about it. So they're, they're very open and very... Uh, Same-sex couple? Yeah. yeah. So, a couple more questions. Uh, your group, the Quad Group Rights Group, what is your relationship like with similar groups across the border in Spain and elsewhere? Yeah, um, well, very early on when, when we started um, what was then GGR in the year 2000, I kind of worked out with my group um, a framework, a strategy, which stretched over 10 years, in which we kind of tried to set target points um, to be able to say by this stage we think we ought to have achieved this and that and the other. One of the first things that we targeted was to set up a proper alliance with people not only in Gibraltar, from as many groups as we possibly could, but also uh, in the UK, uh, at civil society, level and also with politicians and political parties in the UK, similarly at European Union level and of course in Spain, at the local level here, just across the border and in the region around us and also at a national level with Spain. So yes, we've had contact, we've attended conferences, we've uh, exchanged ideas and so on with uh, groups uh, who are working on the LGBT issue in Spain and also at a local level here just across the border in La Línea and also in El Cidas and with local um, Spanish um, trade union movements and so on. There have been quite a lot. And a little bit about you. You began life here obviously in Gibraltar, but you moved to the UK mm -hmm. and you were involved with the Gay Liberation Front in the yep. 70s. Was that what influenced and motivated you to get involved in equality here in Gibraltar and campaigning? It's weird. Um, it's one of these kind of fate or destiny things, you know. Um, yes, I've been involved in um, GLF, Gay Liberation Front, in the early stages in London, setting up with others a gay community centre and being very involved in radical uh, liberation politics at the time. Um, but I'd never conceived of myself as being anybody who led anything or who wanted to be in the limelight and certainly not in, in a political sense at all. Um, it's when I come back in 1997, really with my only aim being to, to live my life and to bring my then um, Filipino partner to be able to live with me in Gibraltar that I begin to see the obstacles and the difficulties that people here in Gibraltar were having and that, that led me to understanding that I could not possibly stay in my own home country without facing the challenge of needing to change things as they were at that time because there was just too much suffering and too much discrimination going on. I certainly didn't want it for me, but I didn't want it for anybody else either. And uh, whilst uh, I found no immediate support from people, I nonetheless made a determination that I couldn't walk away from this without having major conscience problems for the rest of my life. I would never be able to look at myself straight in the face. So, um, so I decided to, to launch this, even though I had no support at that time. But within two weeks, I had uh, 20 odd people who, who came to a public meeting and from there we agreed the framework for the group and it began to take off from there really. And it's been a 17 year journey, people coming, people going for different reasons, but um, I had made a decision back in the year 2000 that I was going to stick through this and I was going to develop it and, and that's where we are now.
What are your hopes for the future in Gibraltar? My hopes for the future of Gibraltar is that certainly human rights is already on the agenda now. I think we've we've placed it on that table now and it won't go away. Uh, it won't be absent as it was in the year 2000, not just for the LGBT community, but for the whole community. I think um, my hopes for Gibraltar is that we will have a developing civil society, a society which develops beyond our uh, paradigms taken from a colonial background and a fortress mentality, that we will become more open, that we will become more tolerant as the years go by, and that we will become more democratic and that we are more able to bring the politicians and the political parties to account than we certainly do right now and that we have a media worthy of its name. Felix Alvarez, thank you very much. You're more than welcome, William.